everyone it's alex and it's been a while while i have been gone um not intentionally for the past couple of months i have been doing some reading which i'll be sure to catch up on with a fall reading wrap up next week but otherwise in terms of what i've been doing i went to a lucy dacus concert which was cool and i cried i went to visit some friends and family and apparently i listened to a mitski song at least 900 times but today i'm actually here to do a tag which is something i don't usually do anyway but it was a tag i was actually thinking about called the book postscript tag which was created by the one and only adam of memento mori booktube fame and i think adam came up with this tag as a way to sort of compliment the mid-year book freakout tag but i saw lukash at totally pretentious do this tag the other day and i remember i think i did it a few years ago but i remember really liking the questions so i thought i would do the 2021 updated answers uh, much like what Lukash did recently. So question one says the longest book you read this year and the book that took you the longest to finish. And the longest book I read this year was definitely a true novel by Manai Mizumura, Japanese retelling of Weathering Heights by Emily Bronte. But also describing it that way feels a little incorrect or maybe even a disservice just because I feel like Mizumura was really great at feeling so inspired by the source material, creating such a wonderful reincarnation of such beloved classic characters that perfectly captures the essence of Emily Bronte's work. But to me personally, I feel like Mizumura even masters much better this sort of overwhelming pang of romance, while tethering a story like Weathering Heights in this updated environment and ambiance, making Mizumura's story all the more compelling to me, and I never quite wanted to put it down if I remember right, but I just remember despite its length, I just really loved reading it. And the book that took me the longest to finish is a bit of a cop-out, mainly because I haven't <laughs> finished it yet. It's The Life of the Mind by Christine Smallwood, which I think I started in September, and I'm pretty sure I will finish it this month, it being in the camp of books I usually really enjoy with my fiction about sort of jaded, apathetic, 20 to 30 something woman. But I don't know why, but about 50 pages into this book, as I am now since September, I'm just having a really hard time latching onto the voice of our main character in this book. Question number two is a book you read this year that was outside of your comfort zone. And for this one, I would probably say Everything I Know About Love by Dolly Alderton. This is a memoir where Alderton recounts her experiences with love, both the platonic and romantic. And I think the way I described this book in a previous wrap up is a combination of Carrie Bradshaw meets Bridget Jones. And why I initially thought this book was sort of out of my comfort zone it's because I've never heard of Alderton or this book before and initially it was reading as very dating columnist to me which is really funny and probably apt because I found out after reading this book was a dating columnist for a few years but this book really evolved into something I really looked forward to reading a lot just seeing how Alderton managed to synthesize her organic sense of growing into understanding the overall power of relationships whether or not they're platonic or romantic. Question three is, how many books did you reread this year? I reread two books, and one of them was Luster by Raven Leilani, and also Pilgrim at Tinker Creek by Annie Dillard. Luster was on the basis of me constantly rereading parts of it to sort of steal little bits and pieces of it that I really liked that I try to mimic in the little novel I wrote as a pandemic project, mainly because I'm convinced that all writers probably just reread their favorite books all the time, hoping that it sounds inspired just enough a little bit to not seem like a complete imitation, but uh, just feeling inspired by. So I think that's been fun to reread uh, this past year. And Pilgrim at Tinker Creek is actually something I reread every year, or at least a lot of uh, portions of it, mainly because it's sort of my summer to fall transition book and it has one of my favorite quotes or maybe my favorite quote ever from a book that I'll put right here and I just really enjoy it and it puts me in the mood of fall beginning. And this transitions nicely into question four which is my favorite reread of the year and I would give it to Pilgrim at Tinker Creek. Question five is a book you read for the first time this year that you look forward to rereading in the future. This one I would say Sorrow and Bliss by Meg Mason which I finished recently. This book follows a woman named Martha as she describes 
this pivotal moment in her life where it feels like it changed forever. And the best way Martha can describe it is whenever she's 17 and there's a moment where it felt like a bomb went off in her head. So for years Martha's seeing a bunch of doctors that they try to diagnose her situation and it's clear that with being stuck in this in-between of different diagnoses possibly that Martha also feels sort of unequipped to handle her relationships whether the platonic, romantic, or also just her professional relationships with a lot of her jobs that don't quite pan out. And it's really funny because as we're really just strung along, or I felt this way as a reader strung along throughout the book, I never felt quite sure what the actual story of this book was. But what really kept it together for me is with Martha's personality, or at least how Meg Mason writes her. With the oversaturated market perhaps of a lot of books featuring maybe this sort of quote unquote disaster woman. I think what puts Martha not quite in that disaster woman contemporary female character category is how well Meg Mason sort of uses her supporting cast in Sorrow and Bliss to really flesh out who Martha is too. All tied together by this very dark humor in this book. Um, reading this book didn't make me feel good but it was really funny. I laughed a lot out loud at a lot of parts. And I think the delivery of those moments is so good because I guess technically Sorrow and Bliss might be a romance novel, but Meg Mason actively sucks the life out of romance at any chance in this book. But Mason does it so well where she chooses to dip in and out of these romantic parts that feel at any turn it could truly become a romance novel. But um, yeah, that's what really kept me going. But now that I have the full picture, I guess, of what the story is of this book, I think by rereading it, it would help me further try to pinpoint maybe what I'm looking for as a reading experience with this book. And either way, rereading this book and getting to experience that really sharp and great dialogue again, I think would be a treat in itself. Question six is a favorite single short story or novella that you read this year. And for this one, I would go with Wayside by Brian Washington from his collection Lot that I read earlier this year that I really loved. Question seven, Mass Appeal, a book you liked that you would recommend to a wide variety of readers. And for this one, I would say Assembly by Natasha Brown. This story follows a black British woman as she's anticipating going on a trip to meet her white boyfriend's parents. Not only is this book short, so I think that would be a good answer for this prompt, but in the span of those short pages, I think this book has really great thought-provoking tendencies towards things like race, class, and gender. And the way Brown introduces these themes, I think is just enough to wear it leaves the reader this sense of accountability, making me as a reader feel like I had the choice to really be invested in our narrator giving these little instances of her frustrations both with herself but also the world. And what that says about reading fiction that can potentially be something that's educational but also fiction. Because to me I didn't really feel like Brown cared about giving an outcome to the premise of this story, being about a black woman meeting her white boyfriend's parents, but instead really getting right this execution of the inevitability of whatever sort of confrontation, in this case just about, you know, uh, racial or cultural difference, preparing oneself for a confrontation of sorts of acknowledging these clear differences. Even if it means it doesn't have to be a inevitable negative experience or negative difference, just acknowledging the connotations of the experience, if that makes sense, it just so happens to be sort of boiling up to this point of being about the narrator meeting her white boyfriend's parents. But it feels like down the road it would have just as easily been something else to lead to this point. Which in turn I feel like is what the narrator is trying to get at, not only with the sense of prose being quite fragmented, but later as we learn how the narrator is also dealing with her own circumstances related to her own body and things like that. So yeah, I think I would really recommend this to a lot of people because I'd be so curious how they are receptive to it with how like short it is but I feel like really packs a punch. Question eight, specialized appeal. A book you liked but would be hesitant to recommend to just anyone. And for this one I feel like I definitely say Detransition Baby by Tori Peters. I think the easiest way to explain this book is that it's basically about three people determining if they want to have a baby together. But what really surprised me about this book in a good way is just maybe how different the reading experience could be based on the audiences that I think this book is trying to talk to. Primarily maybe non-LGBTQ people versus 
LGBTQ identifying people. And of course the binary is much bigger than that and there are so many things in between, but for the purposes of thinking of it that way and with this prompt, it's just the way in which Peters, I think, is so intentional about thinking about both of these audiences with this binary that I think is executed so well with the use of the characters that Peters has crafted and their own performances. And maybe whether reading it through maybe this queer lens or non-queer lens and what that means with the basis of these characters having their own performative actions under the idea of having this baby together possibly. And there are definitely instances where Peters tries to maybe info dump a little, but there's clearly, if I remember right, these little instances where I felt like it's very in versus out group of understanding as a reader, maybe these certain references or things even beyond just pop culture, but how Peters is able to express these very intimate experiences that feel so unique, but I guess could be sort of this larger conception about what it means to be in a community. But yeah, regardless, I would really love recommending this book to people, but I can totally understand uh, I think this would even be a good answer for the previous prompt too, of something I'd want to reread so I feel like I fully understand uh, why I loved it so much, but I did definitely love it. Question 9. Reflect on your year as a bookish content creator, uh, like goals met, uh, good bad memories, favorite videos, etc. So I definitely fell off the wagon with this later part of 2021. But with booktube next year, I hope I do especially kind of get back on here and talk about books more, or at least definitely I know, if anything, I'll probably be reviewing the new Hanya Yanagihara book and also the new L.F. Botman book. Otherwise I'd really love maybe more specialized videos too of sort of getting in there and finally doing videos like uh, how to get into literary fiction or uh, more recommendation based videos. But in terms of videos I've loved this year that I've made, I think it's probably the ones where I felt like I was deviating a little from uh, maybe what I was concerned with people might think of the videos. And those would be ones like my favorite fictional F-Boys video or uh, books for soft boys video. And videos like that definitely <laughs> aren't like controversial, but I can understand where it's like being a little silly, um, but just like how like maybe getting into the insight more of uh, what my brain is like whenever I'm reading certain books. And the final question, or I guess really prompt, is tag some fellow bookish content creators and I would love to. So of course immediately I would love to tag the book hotties, um, so CJ, Jalen, Hannah, Grace, and Kiernan because uh, they would have never done this tag I don't think before. And then the book hotties juniors, so Rebecca, Ben, and Iggy. I'd also really love to see Eric Carl Anderson do this tag and Claire of course, Claire reads books and Matthew Sharapa, Sean the Book Maniac, Sabrina at Bookish Sabrina, Bob the Bookerer, and Ben at Doom Antidote, Alyssa at The Redhead, and David Murphy. And I also want to uh, give little shout outs to channels I've been enjoying a lot who I don't think I've ever mentioned before, and that would be Sean at Travel Through Stories and Carrie Ann at Carrie Ann Bradley. And last but not least, I would tag Adam at Memento Mori because it's his own tag. And I feel like, was it a live or something with Mel, uh, where Adam said he was coming back to booktube, but it has yet to be seen. So Adam, this is your call out, I guess, or something. But that does it for the book postscript tag for 2021. So uh, of course, if I didn't tag you, I would still love to see you do this tag, because I really do think Adam's questions are really good on the basis of thinking of like, end of year stuff. And like I said, I'll see you next week for my fall reading wrap up, and then eventually, my best books of 2021 that I read. As always, thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.